we've made it through for the last four or five weeks, we've discussed both the formation of the New Testament canon and how we know that our copies of, of the New Testament are reliable copies and how the scholars have gone back together and combed through the thousands of Greek manuscripts to put together the manuscripts that are used to translate. And it's been a wonderful time of refreshing study for that in a new sense. But today, we're going to start the Gospels. And my goal on going through the Gospels is to do it in a couple of different ways. First, we're going to actually do kind of an overview look of each book. This is the overview look at the book of Mark. Then we'll dig into some things. We'll dig into the Sermon on the Mount. We'll dig into the parables. We'll dig into uh, the miracles of Jesus. And then in the midst of all of that, we'll deal with what's called the synoptic problem. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. We'll look at John in a unique fashion. And uh, after we finish the Gospels, our goal is to go into the book of Acts. We'll try and integrate in the various New Testament letters that were written within the narrative of Acts so that we can keep that flow going. Then we'll tack on the New Testament letters written after the Acts narrative and we'll conclude with a study of Revelation, uh, God willing. So that's the plan as we go from here. Uh, someone asked me, are you starting with the Gospel of Mark? Because, uh, of Mark? I could have called it the Gospel according to Mark and maybe put any one of them up there. Um, but I said, no, we're starting with the Gospel of Mark because a lot of modern scholars believe that Mark was written first. Uh, I don't have a hard and fast opinion on that. I can see arguments going a number of different ways. But uh, recognizing modern scholarship uh, may be correct, we'll start there. So here's my introduction for you. I was a college student. I was a, a biblical language major. And I was sitting in the, the, the dining hall eating dinner with a couple of my friends who were biblical language majors, including one named Bob Russ. Now, Bob was an aberration. Most of us were learning how to read Greek and how to read Hebrew and, and other languages that were important to, uh, to biblical studies, but Bob seemed to have had Greek somewhere in his bones. I mean, it just it's one of those guys that's just like so good at it that it's in a whole different league and world apart. We would be struggling to remember various declensions or various different, any number of things. Bob, it just seemed automatic. He read Greek the way the rest of us read English. And as a result, there was a certain deal of awe and respect that we all paid to Bob. When Bob said, oh, we know this Greek word is blah, 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 because Xenophon's and Abbasus says in the blah, 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 blah. We'd all just kind of sit there and nod, but inside say, the Bob is really good at Greek. <laughs> now, having said that, some folks let that respect and awe for Bob's Greek flow into other areas, as if Bob could do no wrong. I have deep within me an argumentative disposition. <laughs> Some might say I was built to be a lawyer. I, um, I had zero qualms challenging Bob on things other than Greek. I knew better than to challenge him on Greek. But other than that, I thought this guy, he's, he may be the Bob in Greek, but he's just Bob otherwise. So we were sitting there and we were talking about art. And Bob made some offhand comment about art, that art, you know, is just what somebody does. And, uh, you know, anybody can draw a picture, anybody can blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, but drawing a picture is not art. And he says, well, sure it is. I said, no, no, no. Art is something that has some significance or meaning behind it. It's not simply, and he said, no, you're wrong. He said, what about a painting of a landscape? I said, well, some landscapes are painted to show how light works, or some of them are show how nature works, or some of them to communicate the beauty of a scene. But there is some purpose behind it if it's art. If there's no purpose behind it, it's not art. It's just a reproduction. And he thought I was wrong. And I'm sure, here we are over 30 years later, I'm sure he's never given that another thought. It has continued to eat at me. 
I will find myself jogging in the morning, thinking, ooh, I wish I'd have thought of this point to bring up to Bob. <laughs> because art is something more. And if you're looking at Vincent van Gogh's starry, starry night, you wonder in that beautiful French village he's drawn why the buildings have lights on except for the one in the middle that's the church. And the church is dark. Because there's something more to this than just some reality-challenged, addled mind trying to find peace in the midst of a disturbed life and expressing himself with brilliant blues and bold brush strokes. There's got to be a meaning behind it that makes it art. You know, when you look at, at portraits, a portrait is not a photograph. This is a self-portrait by Francisco Goya. A portrait is not simply a photograph. Anybody can take a picture. But a portrait is something that tries to find an expression of the personality, an expression of the, the concerns, an expression, something that, that, that captures the essence of the person beyond simply a photographic reproduction. Here's where the lines are. Here's how the colors play out. Boom, here it is. And it's not only that way now, it's been that way for a long time. There was a gentleman who was a, uh, lived at the time of the New Testament church, uh, lived in Rome, born in Greece, lived in Rome, uh, named Plutarch. And Plutarch was a very prolific writer. He wrote a lot of things. We've got a lot of them today. One of the things that he wrote were a collection of lives. And what he would do, is, he wrote most of them in pairs. He would take a Greek life and a Roman life, and he would write on both of them in a way to compare and contrast their lives. He would call those bios. We get biography from it. Here's what he said from uh, the introduction to Alexander. He compared Alexander the Great to Caesar, Julius Caesar. He says, it's not histories that I'm writing, it's lives. And in the most illustrious deeds, there's not always a manifestation of virtue or vice. Nay, a slight thing like a phrase or a jest often makes a greater revelation of character than battles where thousands fall. Bear with me. Accordingly, just as painters get the likenesses in their portraits from the face and the expression of the eyes, wherein the character shows itself, but makes very little account of the other parts of the body. So I must be permitted to devote myself rather to the signs of the soul in men and by means of these to portray the life of each, leaving to others the description of their great contest. Let me tell you what he's saying. I'm writing about the lives of these people, but I'm writing them in the way that you draw a portrait. I'm not just grabbing the greatest deeds they did because sometimes it's just in an offhand comment or in a nuance or in something small that you get the greatest perception into their character and who they are. And I'm more concerned about that. That's why this has a capital H. If we can go to the next screen, please. There is a capital H in history. There is a capital L in lives. Those are translated that way because they're, they're a special type of writing. He says, I'm not writing a, a history. This is not a connect the dots of a timeline. This event, this event, this event, this event, so that I'm accurately recording history. I'm being accurate, but my focus is on writing about the life so that you understand the character. It's like a portrait. It's in the nuance. It's the essence. It's the message that I'm trying to convey. That's the way the New Testament writers wrote their Gospels. Each Gospel is a portrait of Jesus. The Gospel writers are trying, Matthew's put together experiences, events, occurrences, teachings, speeches of Jesus to convey a portrait or a message of Him. Mark has done the same thing. Luke has done the same thing. So these don't all read exactly alike. It's not because one's true or another one's not true. It's because each one is written with a focus in mind particular to that author. It's a different portrait. Rembrandt painted a number of self-portraits. 
And each one looks discernibly different as he tried to capture a different aspect of his personality or different nuance of who he was. And you can't look at it and say, well, that's Rembrandt, but that one's not because it looks different. Well, of course it looks different. It's a different portrait, but it's the same fella. It's the same skin. It's the same hair. It's, the sa it's just a, painted in such a way to convey a different uh, uh, aspect of who he was. So we've got the same basic events in a number of different Gospels. We're starting with the Gospel of Mark. But you can look at each of these Gospels, thank you, you can look at each of these Gospels, and as we look at them, we're going to look at both the background of the Gospel and the content, but we'll do it within this ambit of each one being somewhat different in the portrait they want to paint of Jesus. Make sense? There's a great value to reading a Gospel through nonstop. Don't just say, for my quiet time, I'm going to read three chapters a day or four chapters a day, so I'm going to read the first. Sometime when you've got 30 minutes, 45 minutes, sit down with a notepad and say, I'm going to read Mark all the way through from 1-1 to 16, wherever I think it ends. And then you read it through and make little notes. Why does this story, why is it written this way? What's he trying to convey? That we'll try and do some today. We'll start today with the background. If I could get y'all to, thank you. We'll start today with the background. The background of Mark. Now Mark is one of three synoptic gospels. Let's be real clear on that. We've got the three synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic comes from the idea, two Greek words, seen means together, and optica in Greek is, is the appearance of something, how something looks. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because they all basically look the same. The appearance is the same on the stories. They have the same general material, but it's written in a way, or if it's a portrait, it's painted in such a way that it gives a different nuance and a different direction. So with that, the early church taught, now we're in background, the early church taught Okay, we're having some fun here. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, very good. The early church, see, I've got this, but it really doesn't do anything. Um, the early church, you guys are doing great. I'm just giving you a hard time. The early church taught that Mark wrote this gospel, and he wrote it based upon what Peter had taught and what Peter said. Now, the gospel doesn't actually have a title, the gospel according to Mark, as it was originally written. In fact, Mark's name doesn't appear in the gospel as it's originally written. So the reason we say this is Mark is because since the earliest church, it's been known to be Mark's writing of Peter's gospel. Let me give you some early church references to that. Papias, who was born around 60, which may be about the time this gospel was written, died around 130 A.D., said, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, though not indeed in order, whatever he remembered. Papi is one of the earliest references to this being the Gospel of Mark. We can go to Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria, born around 150, died around 215, said the gospel according to Mark had this occasion. In other words, this is how it came about. As Peter had preached the word publicly at Rome, which is where Peter was ultimately martyred, it's where Peter lived at the end of his life. As Peter had preached the word publicly at Rome and declared the gospel by the Holy Spirit, many who were present requested that Mark who was Peter's right hand, Mark, who had followed him for a long time and who remembered his sayings, should write them out. And having composed the gospel, Mark gave it to those who had requested it. When Peter learned of this, he neither directly forbade it nor encouraged it. Now the early church is unanimous that Mark wrote Peter's gospel. Where the early church fusses over it is, was it done with Peter's permission, without Peter's permission, with Peter acquiescing, 
or even after Peter died, some say it was instructed by Peter and Mark was told to write it. So we don't have a consistent understanding of that, but the early church is consistent that this is the gospel that Mark wrote. Mark wrote Peter's gospel. And that's what we have recorded here. To that extent, you can read the gospel and you can pick up nuances that help you see that. One of the fascinating things about reading the gospel, if you read the gospel sometime, just look for gestures that are shown. Look for the t things that indicate it's an eyewitness account, which of course Peter's would have been. Because it doesn't merely recite events, but it does so showing some physical gestures you would not have known otherwise if you weren't there and present. Look, for example, at Mark 3, verse 5. Please. Thank you. Jesus, looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus isn't just angry. It doesn't just say Jesus was angry and grieved at their hardness of heart. He's looking at them. He's looking at them. And he's angry because their hearts are so hard. So he looks at them with anger. Or how about this? Jesus, if we could change slides, thank you. Jesus took the child by the hand. This is where he's, he's raising her from the dead. Took the child by the hand and spoke to her in Aramaic. Says, little girl, arise. Now it doesn't just say Jesus raised her from the dead or Jesus spoke to her in Aramaic, but he took her physically by the hand. So you have these types of gestures. When Jesus heals the deaf man, he puts his fingers into his ear. And after spitting, he touches his tongue. These are gestures that are uniquely found in Mark in ways that show an eyewitness account. Not just gestures, though. Let's move the gestures and under the magnifying glass, look at the way Peter is referenced in Mark. Peter is uniquely soloed out in Mark in some ways, unlike the other Gospels. But the way Mark has fashioned this Gospel, it starts out, the very first Apostle mentioned is Peter. I might also mention that the Gospel itself starts with the story of John the Baptist, not the genealogy of Jesus. And if you go to Acts chapter 10 and read Peter teaching the Gospel to Cornelius, when Peter teaches the Gospel, he starts out with John the Baptist the same way. So the first apostle mentioned is Peter. He's called Simon at that point. Jesus hasn't given him the name Peter yet. But Simon and his brother are fishing. Jesus calls them out of the boat. Come with me, I'll make you fishers of men. The first healing that Jesus does in Mark is Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum. And so the first disciple called, apostle called, the first healing after this healing, Jesus gets up early the next morning. He's been staying in Peter's house, Peter's mother's house. Jesus gets up early and he leaves and goes off for some quiet time. The apostles wake up that are called at the time and where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? It's Peter who goes out and leads the search for Jesus. This is a gospel where when they go back to Peter's house in Capernaum, in this gospel, that house is called home. And Jesus went home. Well, he didn't go to Jesus' home. It wasn't Jesus' home. In fact, Jesus is there when his family comes, his mother and his brothers come and say, hey, you need to, to come on. This was Peter's home that is called home. It was Peter's house called home in the gospel which is what Peter would have called it. Over and over and over, the events in the Gospel of Mark talk about the various disciples. The disciples do this, the disciples do that. Unless it's something that Peter did. And then it emphasizes Peter. Peter and the disciples. Or Peter, James and John. Or Peter, James and John and Andrew. So there's a real focus on Peter in the Gospel of Mark in ways that make it read very sensibly as Peter's eyewitness account that Mark has written up. Let's keep looking. There are some subtle ways that we get an understanding that this could be uh, uh, most reasonably Peter's Gospel that Mark's written up. Um, the, the first subtlety 
not only is there the, the eyewitness aspect of the gestures of Jesus, but you'll see some eyewitness people who have been identified. Mark doesn't solo out a lot of names. But if you get a concordance and you look up the name of Rufus, you'll see Rufus mentioned twice in the entire Bible. First in the Gospel of Mark. This is when Jesus is going to Calvary and the Roman soldiers compelled Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross for Jesus on a segment of that walk. And when Mark tells the story, Mark uniquely says that it's Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country, quote, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, why would you throw in two names like Alexander and Rufus when they have absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the Bible unless they were noteworthy people that the readers might have understood? And it is interesting that the only other reference to Rufus in the Bible, there is a Rufus in Rome. Paul at the end of Romans says, say hey to Rufus. There was a Rufus well known for who he was such that Paul's giving him a greeting even though Paul at that point had never been to the Roman church. So Rufus's fame is beyond the church of Rome. And most likely it's because he was the Rufus, or not most likely, I suspect, I guess is a more honest way to say it, that he was the Rufus of Alexander and Rufus, whose dad had carried the cross. Rome, of course, is where the early church said Peter was when Mark wrote this gospel. So it makes sense that if Mark's recording this gospel in Rome, where Rufus is one of the main people of the church, Rufus, whose father carried the cross, it's a gospel about that event. How on earth could Mark ever have written it without signifying by the way, that's Alexander and Rufus's dad, so that people would know it. Those types of subtleties are there. Um, there are Latinisms. The principal language of Rome was Latin. Now, this gospel is written in Greek, but there are a number of words in the gospel that are Latin words. And it makes sense that Peter who had an interpreter, Mark, who did Greek and Latin. Peter probably was not a writer, I should add. As a fisherman in Galilee, the odds are he, was not, he, he couldn't write. He was probably illiterate. But Mark, on the other hand, the missionary, the kid who was clearly a spoiled rich kid to some degree, if you read about Mark in the, the New Testament, he, 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 had, he came by it. It was not easy for him. He's the one who started traveling with Paul and wanted to go home early. He's the one that Paul said on the next missionary trip, I'm not taking him, he's a quitter. Though in the end redeemed himself, not just with Paul, but with Peter. Because we'll read, Peter at the end of his life writes from Rome and said, she who is at Babylon, which is what the early church was calling Rome, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, the church in, in Rome, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Mark was with Peter at the end of Peter's days in Rome. He writes this with Latinisms, uses the Latin word for a basket, uses the Latin word for a centurion, uses Latin words throughout that would have uh, indicated that this was probably written as the early church said. Let's talk about the style for a moment. Mark wrote this in a real fast-paced style. There's a Greek word that's translated immediately, or forthwith, or right now, or quickly, ASAP type stuff. It's actually just translated immediately, or forthwith, or anon in some older translations. But it, it's this idea of ASAP, next, 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 next. Mark uses that word 42 times more than the entire New Testament put together. Because that's the way he wrote. It's very quick-paced. 
When he wrote, Greek has different verb tenses. They have um, different tenses to talk about the past. There's the aorist that talks about the past kind of in a real historical sense. But there's a, 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 a past tense that stresses the present effects of the past. And then there's a way to write about things that happened that's really present tense. And we sort of do that in English. I can say, okay, so here's what happened. Jesus says to this lady, da-da-da-da-da. You see, and I'm telling you the story. What Jesus says is present tense. But really, Jesus said it. So I could accurately say, Jesus said to the woman, uh, go get your husband. Which is actually a story in John, but sorry, I glitched. Um, all right, Jesus said to Simon, let's use a real one, drop your nets and follow me. Now, I could say Jesus said that to Simon, or I could tell it more as a, as a fast-paced, invigorating story that draws you in. So Jesus goes to, goes to the Sea of Galilee. He sees Simon. He says to Simon, drop your nets, come with me, I'll make you fishers of men. See the difference there? It's the same story, but it's being told in present tense, sort of. It's, it's the action-packed, uh, action fast-paced way of Mark. And so Mark does that, and he'll just say, and immediately they did this, and immediately they did that, and, and boom, 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 and it just moves like this in rapid-fire succession. You read Mark, he doesn't have anything extra. The early church said Mark's the lion gospel because he's just so fast, and he just pounces on the subject. Uh, Luke, he's the ox. That's pretty accurate. Now... Mark's gospel is a flower arrangement. It's not an A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He is n purposefully not writing it in chronological order. This is day one. This was day two. This is day three. He was not working through a diary day by day. He's arranging flowers. He'll take something that happened over there and put it in right next to something that happened two years later over here and put it in. And I take that from a couple of weeks earlier. And then we're going to take it. Yeah, that one's going to look good right here. And he arranges this beautiful flower bouquet. He's like our children. One of our children, Will, was just such a linear thinker. If I wanted to entertain Will when he was four years old, and distract him from whatever he needed distracting from, I could say, Will, if you had four apples, and you gave me two, and then you got three more at the store, but you ate one, how many would you have left? Six. Very good. I tried that on Gracie, our number two child, when she was four. Totally different thinker. I knew it going in, so I tried it a little bit easier. Gracie, if you had two apples and I gave you two more apples, how many apples would you have? Daddy, I don't know. I can't hold that many. <laughs> then, Daddy, if I gave you an apple and I gave you a banana, how many would you have? And I'm thinking, she can't even keep apples and bananas separate. This child's in trouble. I said, honey, I don't know how many. She said, a fruit salad, but you'd have to peel the banana first. Okay? It's just different thinking. Okay? Mark is like Gracie. It's just, hey, we're going to put this together because that's the portrait he wants to paint. He's not concerned. If someone reads Mark and says, well, this gospel's clearly wrong because he's got things in the wrong order. Actually, that's an incorrect statement. The gospel is clearly right because he has things in the wrong order. He did that on purpose. That's the reason he's got it there. He's not writing a history. He's not writing a history in the sense of here's the way the events unfolded, 1A through Z. He's writing a portrait to show you Jesus. And so it's written in a real specific way. Let me show you some of the reasons, some of the ways by looking at the content. When Mark writes his gospel, more so than the other gospel writers, Mark's concerned not only with telling you the stories, 
But he tells the reaction of the people. See, it's not just a portrait of Jesus, but it's also a recognition of how people reacted to Jesus so that we can see ourselves in those portraits. Jesus, it's not just Jesus healed this person. In Mark, it's Jesus healed this person, and the crowd was amazed. They were astonished. They were scared. They were harshly critical. He gives the reactions of the people. So I've taken some of the narrative of Mark and thought, let's look at it through the reactions. And that's what I've done in the paper. I've pulled out just a few examples for the, the, the uh, uh, class presentation, but you can read the rest of them in the paper. First, at least five times Mark uses this word of astonished. There's an astonishment. The people saw Jesus, and, and, and astonished in the Greek is this kind of surprise of, oh my goodness, wow, jaw drop. That's astonishment. So the first time it's used is in Mark chapter 1. Jesus goes into the synagogue at Capernaum. And uh, uh, by the way, if you ever go to Capernaum, and a number of you have, Debbie Riddle will take you if you haven't. You go to Capernaum, and there is a synagogue there that was built on the site of the first century synagogue that Jesus would have done. This synagogue remains that are there are probably from the third century. But it's, it, there's the uh, church built also where Peter's house was. So it's really neat to see right down by the Sea of Galilee where these were. But Jesus goes in to the synagogue, and he teaches. Jesus was a carpenter for 30 years, or till he was 30 or so. He teaches in the synagogue. And when he teaches, he doesn't teach like the scribes teach. And if the scribes teach at all, like you read in the, the, the Old Testament, not Old Testament, in the, in the Jewish commentaries in the Talmud, it's Rabbi so-and-so says this, Rabbi so-and-so says this, but Rabbi so-and-so says this. And that's the way the teaching was done. Rabbi Gamaliel says this, Rabbi Ben Eliezer says this, but Rabbi Shammai says this. Rabbi Hillel says this. Rabbi, Jesus says, this is what it reads, and this is what I say. And Jesus taught as one who had authority. And this left the people astonished. It's kind of like, whoa. Can you imagine if you'd spent your whole life where the teacher stood up and said, I want to teach you this. This rabbi says this, but this rabbi says that. This rabbi says it means A, this rabbi says it means B. And then all of a sudden you get this carpenter who comes in and reads the same text and instead of telling you what rabbi A, B, C, and D said about it, said, this is what I say to you. It's kind of like, ooh, this guy's gutsy. That's astonishing. That's surprising. That's shocking. That's stunning. He left the people astonished. Now Jesus goes to Nazareth and does the same thing his hometown. And in Nazareth, Nazareth, many who heard him were astonished, but their astonishment was not, wow, I'd like to hear more. Their astonishment was, who does he think he is? Isn't this Jesus, the carpenter? Does he think we forget just because he's gone off on some walking crusade? He played with our kids growing up. He thinks he's a prophet. Prophets don't grow up from little boys. They're born that way. Surely prophets were never kids. This guy was a kid. And the people are cynics and they don't believe. And as a result, Jesus leaves and he leaves with sorrow because he doesn't get to heal many people there because of the disbelief. The people are astonished. But how about this? Let's put astonished out of the way for a minute. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebukes the Spirit, casts him out of the man, and this amazed the people. They found it amazing that Jesus teaching in the synagogue with a teaching that astonished them in Capernaum, when a man comes up with a demon and the demon starts crying out, 
Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. You're the Son of God. I know who you are. And Jesus rebukes that demon and casts him out of the man. And the people were amazed. This is something very, very different. Look at the next amazement I pulled. Jesus' silence amazes Pilate. Here's the way Mark tells the story. He says, Jesus gets brought before Pilate. Pilate says, they're, they're accusing you of being the king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, you just said it. You know, those, those are your words. And then all the chief priests and all the people come in and they start hurling all these accusations at Jesus. Now Jesus is on trial here before Pilate. Pilate has the ability to go, oh, or oh. And I don't think there's anybody... Look, I'm a lawyer. I've seen this play out. I've seen... I was was in a a, a judge's hearing in front of a judge in Dallas. Judge Ed Kincaid. Good old Baptist preacher's boy. And this judge, federal judge in Dallas, was talking to a lawyer. And he told the lawyer, look... You've done something that I think's wrong. Now, I expect you to say to me, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, and what can I do to fix it? And the lawyer started making some excuses. And the judge says, I sentence criminals for a living. And every criminal I ever have in my courtroom is always loaded with excuses. They'll never, ever just say, yeah, it's my fault. I'm sorry I did wrong. What can I do to fix it? You sound like a criminal. Don't make excuses. Don't sit there. But the lawyer thought he was fighting for his life and wanted to prove his innocence. Oh, it wasn't my fault. Blah, 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 blah. I didn't do it. I didn't know. I wasn't doing it. I mean, that's what was going on. And the judge is sitting there and he says, I hear this five days a week from every crook in the world. And I'll guarantee you, Pilate's experience was no different than Judge Kincaid's. It, the, the crooks come in. He did this, he did this, he did this. Okay, crook, what do you have to say for yourself? Well, I didn't do it. So Pilate hears all of it, looks to Jesus and says, what do you have to say for yourself? Jesus said nothing. Isaiah 53, like a lamb led to the slaughter, silent. He said nothing. Pilate, you know, I can, I, I got to decide what's right. You know, what, what, how do you defend yourself? What do you, what do you have to say? Jesus had nothing to say. And that silence amazed Pilate. Fear. A lot of people's reaction to Jesus was to be fearful. In fact, one of the stories where Jesus throws the money changers out of the temple, the people are amazed at Jesus' teaching because Jesus calls that, he says, you've taken a house, my father's house should be a house of prayer, you've made it a den of robbers. And the people are amazed They're astonished, but the reaction of the chief priests was one of fear. The two that I want to bring out, though, the two examples of fear. First, fear and the man of the tombs. Jesus and his apostles go across the Sea of Galilee. They get to the Gadarene area. And in the Gadarene area, there is a man of the tombs who's demented, crazy, demon-possessed, He's, he's supercharged, he can't be held, he can't be bound, he breaks the chains, he's got everybody scared to death, he just lives in the tombs, dead man walking. And he comes to Jesus, and the evil demons in him, don't cast us out into the neverlands, don't, 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 you know, please, please. Jesus calls out their name. What's your name? Legion, for we are many. Jesus sees a herd of swine, of pig. Casts the demons into the herd of pigs that go catapulting over the cliff into the water and drown. 
the people from the town come out and they see the man who had been a man of the tombs and he's sitting there clothed. That in itself was shocking. This man had been running around naked is the implication. Sitting there peacefully with Jesus, talking and eating like any sane person. And it scared the community to death that Jesus had such power that he was able to heal this man. Now the other communities who'd seen Jesus heal were bringing everybody that was sick. If Jesus Christ were coming here today, do you think our attendance would quadruple? If he were physically coming here today saying, I, Jesus Christ, Son of God, will heal today. You couldn't keep him from coming in. But the amazing, and that was the way it was. There. I mean, Heavens, Bart tells a story about Jesus in one house where a bunch of people, four guys are bringing their paralyzed friend and they hack through the roof to drop him down because they can't even open the door to get him in. Jesus performs this healing of the man of the Gadarenes, the man of the tombs, and the town is so concerned and scared, they beg Jesus to leave. How would you like to go down in history as the group of people who could have had the Son of God in your town healing, feeding, ministering, and you begged him to leave? But that's what their fear did. Now, that's contrasted by Mark. Mark tells these stories in, in, right in a row because he wants you to see the difference. So Jesus gets on the boat and he leaves and he goes back to the other side and Jairus, who's a ruler of the synagogue, comes up to him and says... Hey, my daughter is really sick. Would you come heal my daughter? Jesus says, yes, I will. On the way, a woman who's got some bleeding touches Jesus' garment and she's healed. And Jesus senses the power, goes out and turns around and says, who did that? Calls her out, wants her to identify herself. She says, it was me. He says, my daughter, your faith has made you well. Go and be healed. Jesus, going to heal Jairus' daughter, stops and takes a time out to heal Jesus' daughter in a non-physical sense. And during that time out, when that woman was healed, Jairus gets word that his daughter died. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your little girl is dead. And Jesus' response is, don't fear. Don't let fear keep you from letting me do what I've come to do. Don't let fear keep me from being the Son of God in your life. And Jesus takes Peter and John, and Jesus goes in with the mother and father, takes the girl by the hand, and heals her. Well, it's not just these. There are more. There's criticism with Jesus. There's anger with Jesus. There's a marvel. They mar oh, the marvel story? That's a, the Pharisees to figure out, okay, we've got to trap Jesus. We've just got to get him in trouble. We need to get him in trouble with the Roman law. We've got to get him in trouble beyond us. We've got to get him doing sedition. So they do this elaborate plan. They get these people who are good actors. And they say, look, we need you here. If we come, he's going to see it a mile off. But you go pretend you're one of his followers and trick him. And we'll get good. We'll get him good. So the, the actors go up to Jesus and say, Hey, best teacher we've ever seen. Love your teaching. We follow you on the internet. <laughs> Thinking about contributing to your ministry, I assume it's 501c3. I'm telling you, absolutely a stellar guy. But hey, we've got, it. We got this question. You know, those nasty Romans. Should we be paying taxes? Well, Jesus wasn't fooled by the actors. Jesus says, okay, hypocrite, throw me a coin. And they toss him a denarius. He says, whose face and inscriptions on this? Caesar? He tosses it back and says, well, you give Caesar what's Caesar's, but you give God what belongs to God. 
and they've got to go back and report back the trap didn't work. But amongst themselves, they said, he's good. <laughs> he's good. Well played. Well played. You know, they marveled at him, it says. I mean, they weren't changing their heart, but they were really impressed. The last thing I want to do is tell you about faith. The way Mark has set this gospel up, you have several pronounced indications of faith. The demons believe. The demons cry out, Jesus, you're the Son of God. We know who you are. You're the Son of God. You're the Most High. You're the Chosen One of God. They, they identify him as the Son of God. Now, you do have Peter in the middle of the book when Jesus has to ask him, who do you say that I am? He says, well, you're the anointed. You're the Messiah. Does not mean Son of God. In Peter's mind, the Messiah, the anointed, you would anoint a king, you would anoint a prophet. It means, it means significant, it's a lot, but it's not an understanding fully of who Jesus is as the Son of God. He's the Messiah, he's the anointed one, he's the chosen one. Of course, that's the same chapter where right after it, Peter denies that Jesus should die, that Jesus should get resurrected, that Jesus should be punished for the sins of the people. Far be it from you, Jesus, to let anything negative happen to you. And Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. If Peter wasn't really on the page. And for this to be Peter's gospel is a great indication of incredible humility. Because over and over and over, it's so clear the disciples just don't get it. The declaration of faith in Jesus as the Son of God comes from the demons and comes at the very end. When all the disciples have fled, when Mark, if it was Mark, who was following around the young man, who in shame and fear, when he's grabbed by the, the, the loincloth, runs, leaving the loincloth in the grabber's hand, so he's running off naked to keep from getting arrested with Jesus. The disciples have left. There are a couple women there at the tomb. Everybody else is mocking Jesus. Everybody else is making fun. For three hours, there's darkness from noon to 3 p.m. Jesus finally breathes his last after crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's a Roman centurion who says, Truly, this was the Son of God. Mark is written in this gorgeous way where in the very beginning the demons recognize Jesus as the Son of God. At the very end the centurion does, but the apostles never do. Until the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. They really didn't have a clue. Truly this man was the Son of God. So this portrait of Jesus we get in the Gospel of Mark is a stunning one, not only for the way it portrays Jesus, but because it demands a response from us. This is a, a, a Gospel that demands, how are we going to respond? Fear? I don't want Jesus in that part of my life. Jesus has a time and place in my life. It's Sunday morning, uh, occasionally on Wednesday night. Right before mealtime, because we'll pray, and uh, other, other times of prayer. But outside, Jesus does not belong in the business world, heavens. Jesus does not belong in this. Jesus does not, is that our response? Are we afraid to let him in? Are we astonished? Do we stand amazed at the presence of Jesus of Nazareth? Are we critical? Are we harsh? Do we ignore him? Some response is no response. Do we marvel, but then go our own way? Okay, well played. Impressive guy. Remind me to think about that again one day. And then just go on. Jesus said, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. This is one of the most profound passages. It's one that causes some, 
people trouble because at the end Jesus says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will still be alive, no, who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming. And people say, but wait a minute, those people did die before Jesus' return. Is this a problem in Scripture? No, it's out of context if you just took that verse. Jesus says, if you want to save your life, then lose it. You give your life to Jesus. You give your life to Jesus, and that's the way you gain your life. That's the way you save your life. If you want to live your life for you, if you want to gain your life for yourself, that's how you lose it. And the sad thing is, Jesus says there are some who will hear the message, but won't give their life up. They won't taste death. They won't lose their life for the sake of Jesus. And that's a sad thing. I want us to follow him. That's my passion and that's my prayer. Next, point for home. They all ate and were satisfied. Mark tells the stories of Jesus feeding the multitudes with very few things. And he tells that story both with the disciples' confusion, their disbelief, their problems with it, but yet the people's ultimate satisfaction. Jesus is into not simply telling us spiritual things. He is a full service, 100% God who's out for our physical needs as well. Give us this day our daily bread. Consider the lilies of the field. All of this we need to take whatever problems we've got, whatever our needs are, whatever our issues are, in faith to Jesus and let him be God. One of our responses to him needs to be to bring what we need to his attention and let him minister. Last point. One of the immediately, one of the 42, is where Judas immediately comes and kisses Jesus and betrays him. These are the immediates. I mean, it just happened, it happened, it happened, it happened. And here's my urge, my point for home from that is this. If we could, each moment, we need to use it in faith, not in rebellion. Don't let our immediate be one where we betray Jesus. Let our immediate be one where we respond in faith. It's a wonderful gospel. Next week, let's contrast Matthew's. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we stop to pray, acknowledging you as God and praying that you'll give us a better portrait, understanding, vision, insight into Jesus our Lord, his love, his compassion, the many ways that he ministers to us and longs to. May we react to him, Lord, in faith and amazement that leads us to service. We pray through Jesus. Amen.